Hey everyone, welcome to Veterinary Tales. This is Colleen Beasley, our co-host. You know me, I'm Scott. And uh, we have a special guest tonight we'll get to in a minute. But before we begin, I think it's important to keep things in perspective. Like I want everybody to understand that this podcast will provide truthful information that can be documented. It will cast a negative tone toward a minority in the veterinary profession. The simple fact that we live with is that 80% of the new members of Joey's Legacy state that they've never had a bad experience with a veterinarian and that they simply joined our Facebook group to learn about the experiences of those who have, hoping to become better educated and therefore better advocates for their own companion animals. Uh, let's introduce our guest, Christy Sharon and her husband, Todd. Hi guys. Hi guys. Uh, they started the Facebook group, Justice for Otis and the Beautiful Souls Lost. They had a tragic event in their life and uh, they're here to tell us Otis's story and, uh, and see uh, exactly what happened. So hi guys, hi guys. Why don't hi. you start off Thanks at the beginning, me. tell us from the beginning what happened. Well, Otis's story um, was about, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, Otis's Thank story you. was about, uh, about a year long. Um, it had started with our primary former vet of four years who we trusted like family, who ultimately we firmly believe gave Otis his death sentence. Um, I had taken him in um, January 2019 for um, a, an ear infection and Indian Prairie Animal Hospital, um, Dr. Benson, um, we looked at Otis's teeth. Um, he had was about to turn nine and we agreed that he needed to have a dental because pugs and their teeth are pretty bad. And so we did the blood work. Um, because he was, you know, considered older and it came back that his liver enzymes were escalated. And so I went into immediate action. Um, we, I had an ultrasound done and a few days later, an ultrasound of his abdomen. Um, so they did like his spleen, his liver, his kidneys, all of that. And a few days later, we got the phone call from Dr. Benson, um, basically he diagnosed Otis with, with uh, cancer. He said that um, they found a um, mass on his spleen and nodules on his liver. So based on just that ultrasound, he diagnosed my boy with, with, with cancer, expressed his condolences, we're hysterical. So the very next day we bring him in to uh, Indian Prairie to see if it had spread to his heart and lungs. It had not. And Dr. Benson told us that um, we needed to remove Otis's spleen for any chance of survival. And we blindly trusted him. And, and it had to be done right away. Right away. No, gave us no other options, nothing. Um, so Otis had his spleen removed. We, I, we did a, we did a little research on our own, what limited resources there are, and we did a Google search. Should, is this a situation where a, a spleen needs to be removed or is there, is there another treatment path? And based on the research, it wasn't, uh, we didn't, I didn't see anything alarming that would suggest that the spleen didn't need to be removed. So we proceeded with that. Yeah. And I mean, he, uh, the, our vet, Dr. Benson said, this is the only thing we can do to try to save our boy. So he had a 33% chance of it being benign and it was benign. Um, no cancer on his spleen, nodules, fine. Fast forward that September to uh, about 2019, um, we were getting ready for bed and Otis was laying on the bathroom floor because it was cold. And um, I heard him make a yelp. And I ran into him and he was struggling to get up. So I called the next day Indian Prairie thinking maybe he had a seizure or something. And Dr. Benson wasn't in and they had this vet, Dr. Ernstein, who 
saw Otis the next day, um, did his blood work. He calls back with the blood work results that Otis has diabetes and he's anemic. Um, mind you, after Otis had his spleen removed, Benson, nothing about like what to look for afterwards, follow-ups, no education for us, nothing. Like just left us in the dark, like everything's fine now, go on, have a happy life. So I, when I got these results on the phone from Ernsting, being that Dr. Benson was our vet for four years, you know, I told him, you know, with respect, you know, I want to follow up with Dr. Benson. He did the surgery and, you know, all of that. And that Dr. Ernstein immediately copped this attitude and was acting like a little toddler, you know, well, fine, you know, then, you know, he can just give you, you know, the medication for Otis's ears then, you know, and I didn't know what to do. And, you know, we had been with them for four years. Basically, we felt like we were, we were the, our doctor didn't want to see us anymore because, you know, there was complications. And so they were trying to pawn us off onto somebody else. So for liability reasons. So, so is that, was that Benson or the second doctor? This is this. So Dr. Benson, basically, I, we feel pawned us off to Dr. Ernstein. Oh, I saw because Otis was because having complications and I'm the pet parent that, you know, I want to know everything, you know, I when Otis was going to have his ultrasound. I didn't want him to even be in a cage like I sat in the lobby with him for four hours till it was his turn. So I'm sure you know they were, you know, irritated by me but I I'm, I was that pet parent that you know, was always with him always by his side. Oh, you know, just oh. I'm, I was I was the over top pet parent because I love him so much. He's my son. So Ernstein being Otis has was got di, has diabetes now and anemia and Ernstein puts Otis on a high dose of prednisone and it did not go they, well. One second, it did not go well. The prednisone Otis did not react well to it. We had videos, everything, and. Ernstein, the Dr. Ernstein would not like compromise with me. He, I mean, he, the attitude, he would not give, like, there was no, okay, well, let's try this. Let's try this. No, it was his way or the highway. So then basically we're watching for anemia. Otis's gums are getting pale. And then that's when we took him down to U of I. Um, it's in Illinois. Uh, it, the, the, uh, the owner of the of the vet hospital is an alumni of University of Illinois. And so he's got a relationship where he does courses for them. So any any type of case that presents that it might be too difficult for his practice, he'll immediately send them off to the university. So it's a teaching hospital. So Otis was there for a week. We couldn't see him. And they're treating him like a guinea pig. They're not finding anything. And they sent finally released him after a week because Otis was not doing well. Obviously, you know, he's not seeing his mommy, and daddy, his brother, he's being all these tests and they send him back. They give us back him back to us and they say a uh, possible um, a GI bleed. So the very next day we had to take him to Indian Prairie for, you know, because he just got out of the hospital and word got back to Indian Prairie that I was upset about this prednisone. And I had demanded that we see Benson. I was done with his Ernstein. Benson was our primary. And to make a, basically, he fired us right there. He didn't examine Otis, nothing. He said, we didn't trust them. And it's best to go somewhere else. All because I, again, would not let it go about the prednisone. So at that moment, Christy, when he fired you, as you say, what was Otis's condition? Um, he was sick and their oath that they took, I, I mean, I wrote a letter, they broke so many oaths. They couldn't, they sh by the, the oath the veterinarian takes, they, could, they couldn't, but they did not treat him 
Like they had to, they wouldn't even examine him. They had to by their old treat him because he what he was deemed that that ill. Somebody he needed to be monitored by, uh, for his RBC count. His red blood cell count was uh, elevated because they just put new blood into him. So they need to keep an eye on to see how healthy that blood is holding up. Right. So yeah. they suggested going back to our regular vet you know, in four or five days so that they can. Well, that was the U of I, yeah. yeah. But no, but back to, back to um, Benson and he, they're supposed to give a referral. They didn't. Um, they, I mean, I begged them. I was hysterical and I'm begging them to, to look at him and, and Benson just said, no more, no more communication and shut the door on me. And I had the owner I, you know, I'm having a panic attack. I was present too. And Todd was present too. I mean, I, I mean, they just completely goodbye. No, no referral, no nothing. It took us forever to get his records. And then we took him to another uh, vet. Um, and they even said that they never should have removed Otis's spleen. And to this day, we, I firmly believe that is what caused probably the anemia. Um, so very complex case. So then basically Otis, we could not keep his red blood cells up. And if we didn't get him emergency blood transfusion, he would collapse and die. So that's where, um, veterinary specialty center in Buffalo Grove came into play. And they are the ones that ultimately caused Otis's life. Tell us, tell us about the, uh, the lengths you went to to get his records what did you how did you start the process how did they push back what did they say and when did you finally get them um immediately when they fired us i demanded them all um i demanded them from otis max and our we had a rabbit at the time and they were you know okay yeah we'll get them to you we're busy right now we'll get them to you um you know i, I mean i i was hysterical we we're in a state of panic um, we, when we took him to the next, uh, that, you know, we still didn't have the records they're calling, you know, they, they, we, we had to, we had, we were in a panic. So we had to find a, a, a vet that was local to us. So we found one that was about 20 minutes driving distance. So cause we needed his blood to be monitored on a daily, almost daily basis. So, yeah. And then also the, the, the vet, the, 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 the primary vet after Indian Prairie, wanted a copy of the pathology report on his spleen. They never got that. I sent in the request. Um, I contacted the um, uh, American um, Animal Hospital Association, the vet board, wrote in complaint uh, to both. Um, they completely dismissed that, said that that's not their jurisdiction. Um, so that that was the first half of it and then the second half is when um we're at but um veterinary specialty center for blood transfusions and that's when we got introduced to the internal medicine dr amitano dr mordecai and the owner mitch robbins so what happened from there i mean where did um, so so when we went, um, Armanta Dr. Armentano was his primary doctor and they never knew. So we went from about what, Oct September, October, September, October until the very end of January. And originally it was, oh, you know, he, you know, um, blood transfusions. And then it was, well, he may need a full blood transfusion, you know, emptying all of his blood out, putting new blood in. And then it was, oh, it's actually an iron, um, iron deficiency. Um, and, you know, it was all these different hypothetical, um, it's this, it's that, and let's tr treat it with this and let's do that. And let's put him in the oxygen chamber and let's have this procedure done. Let's have that procedure done. It was all verbal, nothing in writing, no treatment plan in writing, nothing that says, you know, we've done this before. We, 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 we've had a pug presented to us and there's none of that. There's, there's, there's no, there's no data to support what's coming out. They can just say anything with impunity and we're just like, okay, well, I want a documentation of what, where's the plan going? You want, you want, you want to admit our dog. Okay. Well, 
just giving us a, a quote, a bill or an estimate isn't. You know, and then they were, what got, you know, the worst part too is they were really good, bad actors. You know, they gave me and Todd so much false hope that these procedures were gonna work, that our boy was gonna survive. Because if, you know, maybe one of them had been honest with me and, you know, not treated my boy like another number or another body for them to make money on, I would not put him, I would never put him through nearly half of what, what he went through. And I hate myself to this day for that. And I hate them for giving me this false hope when it, Otis was the one who, you know, had to go through it all. Um, I mean, it was just, it was just a total cluster. It was, they, they don't, they never cared about Otis. They, they don't, they weren't interested in a complex case. It was a body factory to them, a revolving door. They just want, you know, in and out, in and out. And they, you could tell we're getting irritated that we kept coming back because we're trying to save our boy, but they didn't want to be bothered. They never, none of the internal, like Dr. Armentano, Dr. Mordecai, both internal medicine doctors, none of, they never collaborated with each other. Um, yeah, I mean, it just, even to this day, just trying to explain it all. It, it's just, it's just an absolute nightmare. Um, <sighs> They treated each thing that he presented as, oh my gosh, we never thought he'd come back. You know, it was like, there was no, okay, once once you're there at the hospital, they, they treat the cases here and now. You're here, you're now, here and now, let's let's treat. But as soon as you leave, the, the pet leaves, it's, it's an afterthought. They're not thinking, okay, this pet's gonna present again in, in a few weeks, we'll never see him again. I mean, who's gonna pay? A thousand dollars a night for a hotel stay, for a hospital stay, you know. A lot of people don't want, aren't going to keep coming back. But we were dedicated pet parents, and we trusted them that that their plan, their verbal plan, was we were still on a good path, and they still were, you know, were had, we had, there, had it under control that he, and, he could and were, survive, and, they, and that taking him to another hospital was the worst thing that we could do because we'd be putting them through everything again. Right. So they, they shame you and then into uh, getting a second opinion. So, so what did they what did they do for his diabetes with the prednisone? How long was he? So on that, that yeah. So basically, because of the fact that um, it they um, we w had to wean him off of that, but by the time he was fully weaned off, he passed not too long later, but um, he, that prednisone caused his diabetes to accelerate. And one day in November, I went to work for four hours. I left for work, my boy saw me and I came home from work and he couldn't find me. He walked right past me because he had went totally blind in hours. Sorry. And all they could tell me was, oh, a basic Google search for his heavy adjuster or coma for his condition, I could easily find out that he was at a high risk for blindness. And what well, was there anything? Else? There's something else. But he, he, and it, it happened, he went blind. And, and he went blind but, in hours. And he, he let me just talk for him. Okay. Um, and, and he, he, he did not do well blind he lost he lost his will and you know um seeing your boy going see your boy blind his eyes it um it's something that i'll, I'll never uh, it's burned into my mind it was it was hard for for us to adjust to him but they they quickly tried to calm us uh veterinary specialty center said you know this is something that could be treated. They wrote us, uh, told us to go see an eye doctor saying that that with surgery nowadays that they can fix that. Yeah, but he had to be stable. So all our hope was getting him stable so our, we could get our boy to see again. So after all of the, about 15 blood infusions and we realized that it he does have a vitamin D, an iron deficiency, I'm sorry, but the iron shots aren't helping. 
um, they ended up doing a scope on him and they found um, a mass in his GI. But later looking back at the report, there was no fluids found around that mass, meaning it wasn't bleeding. But at the time they're saying that this is the cause, this is the cause. So Mitch Robbins went in and removed it and um, it caused Otis to have a, um, get a severe case of uh, pancreatitis. Um, and I had um, Armentano tell us that Otis was cancer free, literally cancer free were his words. Two days later, Mordecai, the Dr. Mordecai in internal medicine says, Otis has cancer and he has a year to live. So I'm getting like different answers from the same team. Yeah. Mitch Robbins disappears. You know, we never met him, nothing. It was a brief phone call. Um, and by that point, um, Otis was on um, 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 a food a food pump um, to get him nutrition, but... Um, we ended up having to devote a vast majority of our life to taking care of him because it was basically hospice care for him at that point. But the doctors were all acting like he's fine, that that he's going to be fine, and that you know. And we that, and I believe, but I don't that. think many people realize that at, at this point, when their dog is at the age of ten, that they're going to be at home caring for them with feeding them through a kangaroo pump through artificial. They're, you know, pet parents aren't aware that that's what it, that's what the veterinarians are going to send you home to do at some point if your dog, if you don't want to spend the money to, yeah, to be, care for your, for them to professionally care for your pet. Beginning of January, I I, I quit my job. Um, I was working private practice to care for Otis twenty four seven, which I gladly did. I'm his mommy. I I do it again in a heartbeat. Um, and. Uh, he just got worse. And so um, February 1st, 2020, we had to have a vet come to the house to give him the shot to go to heaven. Sorry. And he left his world in my arms. And it just, um, I mean, just listening to us now, it just, I know it's probably so hard to follow. And I mean, you can imagine at the time going through it, none of it makes sense. We never got answers. No one ever sat down with us at, at, at Veterinary Specialty Center to talk to us, to explain to us. I, I, I'm at home, you know, giving him his medicine, you know, frantically trying to research on Google um, that ask.com. I'm consulting with a vet on there trying oh, to find answers. Yeah. So his sugars must have been elevated because of the prednisone. Was he on insulin? Uh, I mean, what was he going was on? He was on, um, yeah, he was on insulin and we put um, the Freestyle Libre on him. So we didn't, cause they ended up blowing out all of his veins from everything that had ha happened. Oh. Well, that's that's oh. the real tragedy is, you know, when, when, uh, is how many things they inject into the animals as, while they're under the care. And, and they do, they have a timeline. They, after I complained and demanded some sort of documentation, they, they literally sent me every single minute, minute to minute from the time that he's admitted as a patient to the 48 hours or 72 hours, 72 hours that they discharge him, every minute is accounted for. And so that you can literally see- If it's at, true though, what they documented. <laughs> so you can see how many times they stick a needle in, the, these, in these pets hundreds of times that like how many times are you going to inject these, our poor animals and we and, and and i allowed it I, i'm his mommy and i allowed it because i thought i was stupid and it's selfish because <laughs> i was trying to save them and i didn't realize that they were causing them more harm at the time every decision you made you believe was in his best interest I just wanted to save our boy. we i know many of us go through that it's there's we make the best decision we believe to be the right thing to do at the time okay so let's talk about what we've anyone that knows your group that's seen your group on facebook 
has seen the cover photo and the activity in the cover photo. Tell us a little bit about, we obviously understand why you did that. I think 100% of us applaud you for doing that. And I personally would love to see every person that's in your position do the exact same thing. Tell us a little bit about how that all started and um, how it actually went for you. Well, minutes before Otis left our, our world, I promised him two things. One, I would take care of his little brother, Max. And two, that I would see that he got justice, that he didn't die in vain. So we decided, both of us, to protest outside Veterinary Specialty Center to raise awareness of what happened. Um, I know it's you guys are probably having a really hard time following us, and we apologize. We we practiced and everything, but it it just you're fine. You're fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're fine. We, we um it, I made flyers um. And um, I, I did a peaceful protest. Um, and so basically, so what, what, what I decided, when we decided to do it is because after Otis passed, I didn't have a cause of death. And I called them and I wanted to speak to practice manager, someone like that. And they refused to let me speak to this person. They wouldn't give me the name. So I just said in a totally non-threatening way, okay, well, I'm going to come up there and I'm going to sit in the waiting room and wait till she speaks to me. They hung up on me and they called Buffalo Grove police on me. <laughs> okay. So after that, I'm like, okay, they're not going to tell me. They can't even tell me how my boy died. We, me and Todd, we talked and we decided to have a protest and a peaceful one. So I, I, did my research, figured out, you know, what I could and couldn't do. And the very first day of the protest, um, they called, obviously, every time we protest, they called Buffalo Grove Police. But the officer who responded was the officer that had called me that night when they called the police on me. And he heard a little bit more of my story. And I'll never forget, he, he had a tear that dripped down his eye, down his face. And we had their full Buffalo Grove Police's full support. All they asked was that we would call them, let them know when we'd be there because Veterinary Specialty Center, we'd go for about like three hours or so. And they call the cops on us probably five times. I have it on video. Um, and that officer, God bless him, actually went above and beyond and had a government survey done so we could find out exactly where we could stand, which was what public versus private, because we kept getting moved around. Right. So we were doing it pretty much every day for weeks and then COVID hit. And then so out of respect for COVID, we had stopped. Right. But um, it's a, if anybody knows Veterinary Specialty Center, it's at a very busy intersection. So we, you know, we were holding our signs, passing out flyers if anybody, you know, in um and that's when I had just started the Facebook group. Um, we got many, many supporters. And we also got a lot of hate from the employees, but whatever. Um, and it definitely, it definitely did create a lot of awareness. Um, we want to go back and protest now that COVID's, you know, but um, they're actually moving their facility. Um, what city are they going to? Just a neighboring town. They're moving to a neighboring town. So I'm just, we're kind of waiting for that. Um, and then, you know, when I started my group, I thought, I don't know, maybe like 20 members. I never thought that, for, you know, I get as many members. I think we're almost at like 600. And I never thought I'd get that many in a million years. And then I um, start, started the website, justiceforotis.org. And it's always going to be a work in progress, but since it's launched, over 14,000 people have viewed it. And so that's 14,000 people that know Otis's story, know my son existed, and that he had a soul, he had a life, he had a family, he's loved, and he always will be. And hopefully that maybe it can save 
a pet's li- a, a companion animal's life maybe maybe that what it'll save one we could just save one pet and and and, and their family that, that 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 that's our goal by protesting and we were able to find other victims they saw us <laughs> protesting and it started people started word of mouth and then we decided to go online and share our story and this day and age, we, people are able to connect via social media so much right. easier than they were in the past. So people are telling right. their stories. Right. We know about 35 individuals slash families who went through very similar to what we did. With we discovered Otis. that our hunch was we were onto something because there were other people that were had negative experiences with this with this specialty hospital. And that was the big thing because the way they played us, I was like, there's no way that other people haven't been victimized by their, their by their business model because it's just a pure evil business. We didn't that know that running. they could do this. We I never in a million years thought I would say the veterinary profession is corrupt. So we've had um, other people join us in the protests that have been victims of this exact specialty center. And that's right. what we wanted people to know that if you are in the Chicagoland area and you are looking for a top vet specialty center 24 seven, this is the one that they're sending dogs to. This is what the one- And cats. And cats. And it's, is, yeah, it's considered is, the Mayo Clinic in this area. It, it, and the thing too, people, we're trying to tell people to do your research. You know, there are other options. There are other specialty, it may be a little bit more of a drive, but you know, I mean, there's not that many 24 for our specialty center vets in, in our Chicagoland area, but there, are, you know, there are more than just veterinary specialty center. And you know, do your diligence, do your research, go get a second opinion. Don't don't listen to let the, let those vets make you feel like you know you're doing something wrong by by doing that. We went to you. We went to the University of Illinois Teaching Hospital. We had a great experience. This hospital was two hours closer. The veterinary specialty center was was within an hour's drive and time was of the essence for Otis's care. It was twice the price, but we thought, you know what? They've got a valet parking, they got a state-of-the-art technology. We're gonna get the best possible yeah. experience from it. We're gonna pay for it, but we don't mind paying for it if we're gonna get the service that we want. Right, of course, when absolutely. We walked, when we walked in and we got our car valet park, they have a, aquariums in the lobby, a state-of-the-art cafeteria, high tech. So we expected our dog to be treated like we were being treated, like we right. were being pressured in. We wanted that service to be for our dog, not for us. We don't care about the free coffee. Take care of my dog. Right. I don't want him in my cage. Right. I don't want him in a metal cage sitting back there with a bunch of other dogs I, 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 for a thousand bucks a night. No, thank you. All right, exactly. <clears throat> Tell us, uh, about any experience you had with the uh, vet board in Illinois, if any? Um, well, the vet board, yeah, I, I sent a complaint to them about Indian Prairie and it was dismissed. I got this letter um, that, you know, um, it's not in their jurisdiction, um, that they don't, you know, deal with, you know, complaints like this. And then I got a totally contradictory email again from the same person saying that she spoke to the owner of Indian Prairie and he was, you know, so sorry and, and, you know, expressed his condolences and that he made changes. And I said, really, what are those changes? And she's like, oh, I'm not privy to that information. It doesn't I'm like, okay, so obviously you did nothing. Right, right. And then um, Veterinary Specialty Center, Mitch Robbins, uh, retaliated against me pretty severely. Um, I had three of his attorneys call and threaten me in, in emails as well. It didn't work because I don't back down to anybody. Um, and it never resulted in anything. But then not. he also um, wrote a bogus um, complaint uh, to the state board against my social work license. Um, and it was immediately dismissed because number one, he's not my patient. And number two, it had no merit. So um, that's another message I wanted to get out to people is, do you really want a man who is going to retaliate and go after you? You killed my son and you having your lawyers after me. And now you're trying to go after my livelihood. Do you really trust a man with that character? 
to operate on your dog or your cat or to take care of your pet, that is not a man. That is not a human being. I have words for what that is, but I'll be a lady right now, yeah. but he yeah. is going to go to hell. Okay. Fair enough. And you know, uh, the exposure and the education that we can provide to uh, people that are uninformed, unwitting future victims of these bad actors uh, is invaluable. And we need to continue to do it so that we can really make a difference. And um, I want to thank you guys for sharing your story. I know it's difficult. It's been four years for me and I have my bad days. It, it, it doesn't go away. No. Uh, unfortunately, it's just yeah. there. And um, we have to find a way to, uh, to deal with it one day at a time. And uh, that's what we're going to keep doing. We're going to keep fighting with, uh, with Jer Jerry's books and uh, John's documentary. And we're going to do whatever we can to fight back. And they will lose sooner or later. They're not going to have any choice. There's millions and millions of us. And uh, not all that many of them. So Exactly. And obviously, Mitch is pretty intimidated by me because he's trying to do all these tactics against me. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, I'm not going away, Mitch. I, I will be in your life for the rest, you know, forever. I'm not oh, going away. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks very much. We appreciate your time very much. And, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. That's right. Uh, hey, thank you. Sorry that if it was. There's no, no, you have nothing to be sorry about. We appreciate what you did and everything went very well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank sure. you, Colleen. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to get into our last segment, which is uh, pulled from the public records of uh, vet boards around the country. Uh, I thought I'd start with. Um, Joey's case. And again, these are all public records. In this case, this is the Florida Board of Veterinary Medicine. All of this information can be found at myfloridalicense.com. So we attended the final hearing of Dr. Jean Rindernecht, uh, who was Joey's substitute vet that day. Uh, and I'm just going to read it verbatim. There's no subjective anything in this. It's purely word for word. Dr. Rinderneck was, pre was present and sworn in by the court reporter. Uh, Dr. Powell was recused from his case due to her participation on the probable cause panel. So the probable cause panel reviewed my records, determined there was probable cause to file a complaint, which they did. Um, and so therefore they charged him with a violation of Florida statute 474-214, 1EE e. E. and 1R. One 1EE one e. E. is sloppy record keeping. My, my words, of course. Uh, failure to uh, document vital signs and other required information. And of course, the more serious uh, count one was uh, being guilty, of, and I'll read it verbatim, being guilty of incompetence or negligence by failing to practice medicine with that level of care, skill, and treatment, which is recognized by a reasonably prudent veterinarian as being acceptable under similar conditions and circumstances. Uh, so that was count one. That was the practice below the standard of care count. Uh, after discussion by the board, the following motions were made. Uh, motion was made by one of the two consumer advocates who rarely do. Uh, she made a motion to dismiss the, uh, the more uh, serious charge of practice below standard of care. And as it happens, the motion was seconded by the other consumer advocate uh, who are really just, the, the board in Florida has seven members, five veterinarians, two consumer advocates. But uh, it seems to me, at least in my case, uh, they mimic the, uh, the, the thoughts and the ideas of the veterinarians on the board. So it's kind of like having seven vets on the board, which is way over the top. We'll save that for another discussion. Um, anyway, all seven of them voted unanimously to dismiss the serious count, the more serious count, which basically was, in my opinion, what led to the outcome. Anyway, 
Um, the vet was fined two thousand dollars and three hundred and fifty seven dollars in costs, which was paid or was uh, had to be paid within thirty days. Uh, one year of probation, which is basically nothing. The vet can still practice uh, unimpeded. He can do you know pretty much anything vets normally do. And of course, this is my favorite. During the one year of probation, a records pull of five patient medical records shall be completed and sent to the board for review. So think about it. Instead of an investigator from the state walking into the vet clinic and saying, hello, I'm here. I'm gonna, I want five records at random and I'm gonna review them and see if, if you're in compliance. They don't do that. They let the vet pick his own five records and send them to the vet board for review. So would you imagine that some vets would take the time to um, alter, modify, you know, uh, so that they make sure they're clean before they're sent to the vet board? Uh, so anyway, that's what happened in this case. And um, another case where Joey didn't get justice, uh, and this is what basically prompted uh, the, the birth of Joey's legacy. And we've gone from, like you said, you had 20 and you went to 600 people and you couldn't imagine ever having that many. Well, you know, it's four years for us, we're up near 2,700 people. Uh, most of them st state they've never had a bad experience, they're there to learn, you know, which is fine. But, you know, we have to make sure that we expose whatever we can expose to the public, to these 85 million pet parents um, in the United States. How many of them have had bad experiences with us? We don't know. We have no idea. But everyone needs to be aware of what goes on, the truth about what goes on, and they can make their own decisions on, you know, they're, you know, hopefully they'll take more time to learn how to be a better pet parent, how to better advocate for their companion animals and to be not so trusting when it comes to uh, this profession, even though the majority are, are you know, are, are well regarded, unless you get a really strong referral from a friend or family member, you have to do your own due diligence, like you said. So um, that's where we are. And uh, we'll continue to fight the good fight. Uh, Christy, I know you guys are awesome supporters of Joey's Legacy. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, I wish more people in the group were as active and passionate about this as, uh, as you guys are. And um, do you have any final thoughts? I was muted, sorry. Right. Um, it was a member of Justice for Otis that led us to you and um, we feel exactly the same about you. We wish that there were a million more people like you, you, Scott, with your Thank dedication you. as well, you know, JL and John and just the whole team. And just, we all have to come together because we all have this, the same common mission vit and vision. And we need, there's power and strength in numbers. Absolutely. And we need to educate the other pet parents out there that yes, this happens and it's happening too much. This is a alarmingly growing epidemic and it's not going to stop anytime soon. Right. And we cannot sugarcoat it. And we, you know, we need to just, we need that we need our message heard and we need people to believe it and to say, we're not, you know, we need, they need to believe us and trust us and have some faith that we are trying to help them so that they are not going to end up like us. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's one of the wonderful things about this group. We're able to help people if they want to be helped and if they exactly. want to listen to us, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. Okay. My final comment, you guys don't forget about next Sunday night, 8 PM Joey's legacy round table with Carrie Hyde. Carrie's guests will be Dr. Michael Dim and uh, Boston Dog Lawyers founder and attorney, Jeremy Cohen. So next Sunday night, 8 p.m., 
Uh, we'll see you guys then. And uh, everyone that uh, joined in here, I can see there's a, a number of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. And Colleen, you want to say anything? Thanks for telling your story again. It was it was heartbreaking and touching and, and your activism is, is what we truly need. So thank you. Thank you, Colleen. And thank you so much for being a part of this with us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Right. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Okay, take care. Yes. Take care. Bye. Bye.